Hi, uh, welcome back to Behind Those Scenes with Aris Mejias for the Philadelphia Latino Film Festival. Um, I have with me Marian Perez and Ilia Vélez, and I will let them introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Marian Perez Riera, and I'm the director, producer, and editor of Rita Moreno, just a girl who decided to go for it. And and my name is Ilia Vélez, and I'm a co-producer and post-production supervisor for the film. So these uh, behind those scenes um, interviews this year will be geared towards um, minorities, women, BIPOC and LGBTQ content creators um, and how they either have had a space on decision-making or not. And I, I prior sent you some questions, which I'm gonna go briefly over them and we can talk. Um, so let's start with you, Ilya, because you're on the screen right now. How many years have you been producing and what do you consider yourself to be like in this world, filmmaking world? Well, I, I'm a producer. Um, I've been um, working in production um, for about, I would say about 30 years now. Wow. Um, I started in documentaries, but right away changed due to the, the reality of our industry to advertising. Um, so, and I spent, um, I would say about 20 years of my career doing, uh, advertising, but in between I would do, um, a documentary or so. And, um, about 12 years ago, 15 years ago, I started producing, uh, feature films. Um, I started with Jacobo Morales, which is our, our um, most important um, director to date. And then right after that, I had the privilege to work on a beautiful film with Mariem and Carlitos, eh, Mal de Amores. Um, and then um, it's been evolved to doing mostly either documentaries or features and leaving behind advertising. Okay, well, I didn't, I didn't realize that you had so many years in advertising. I guess I forgot, <laughs> I forgot it. Um, and you, Marianne, um, what do you consider yourself within the industry? More an editor, more director, more producer, more, more what? Um, I consider myself director and producer the, mostly. Um, I started as an editor, um, editing, commercials, editing uh, music videos, and I edit a film uh, for Daddy Yankee. The, <laughs> wow. <laughs> I think it was, was like, <laughs> ¿Cómo es que se llamaba eso? Um, Talento de Barrio. Talento de Barrio. I auditioned. <laughs> so I edited that film. That was my first feature film that I edit. And my second one was Mal de Amores, actually. Um, but I've been editing a lot and uh, I studied film. So I, I wanted to be a director all my life. And, and I consider editing was a great opportunity for me to understand better what you need as a director. Um, because when you're in the editing room, that's when you see what you have, what you don't have, what you're missing, what you would have loved to have more. Um, and I've been directing for, um, I would say 20 years, commercials, documentaries, and now, I'm, and I directed with Carlitos Ruiz, uh, Malia Amores, which was our first feature, and I directed um, a few documentaries. Um, this would be my, most important one because although I've directed other feature films, other feature documentaries, this is the biggest I have had the opportunity to produce, to direct and to produce for many reasons. So on both cases, you, you have um, documentary and uh, fictionalized uh, scripts for filmmaking. How was the transition from either 
advertising or editing working behind um, the scenes within, not, not necessarily within like decision-making. How did you come about with those, that transition? I think um, doing commercials gave me the opportunity to play with many, many of the tools that you get to, to work with in a commercial because there is a big budget or usually you have a big budget, so you're able to work with the cameras that you want to, or the dollies, or the cranes, all of that. Um, so definitely making commercials help, helped me a lot. And it also helped me understand the production aspect of it because I, I became a producer making commercials because I wanted to have my own um, company so that I could, um, be able to gain more money so i i had to uh, to learn to to do budgets and to learn how to administer the money and where to allocate it so definitely commercials helped me a lot on that but it also helps you to to tell a story especially if there are those type of commercials to tell a story in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it is great to make, make commercials, especially for that reason. Um, my, my transition to documentaries was very easy because that was the first thing I did. The first thing after I came back to Puerto Rico, I did this documentary called Cuando lo pequeño se hace grande, which talks about the, all the fights that went um, through in 1997, 98, when, when we were fighting to take out the U.S. Navy from mm -hmm. Vieques. Mm -hmm. and, and so I was there doing everything. I had my camera and I did everything, um, shoot, edit, everything. But um, doing documentaries, I love it. Um, it's my passion. I, I think the hardest for me has been doing um, feature films, although my next project, I hope it's this feature film that I wanna make that my sister wrote. Um, but I, I, I also think that making documentaries is as it is with commercials. It is a way to, to learn how to tell stories with what you have around and not necessarily have to um, go into big things in order to make a story, but with little things, with um, a limited amount of- um, Yeah, conditions that you don't really control. Like it's on the fly, you have to- And of course yeah, everything I, I, in, in I'm documentary- I'm a fan of filmmakers uh, yeah. who start within documentary because even their cinematography changes. Um, they'll be able to yeah. just, like shoot with whatever they have. They're not too focused on, let me look for this beautiful special light that will light this way and that no, to just work raw. Um, yeah, I, and, I, in I really editing, and in the editing room, that's when you do a documentary, that's where everything happens. That's where you write the story. So um, it helps a lot also to be in the editing room when you're doing a documentary because it gives you all those other learning experiences. Ilia, um, so now I, likewise as Marianne, you transitioned from, um, or, you, or you went between these worlds. What made you go from one to the other and choose to leave the, the advertising world? Well, actually it was the other way around because I started in documentary. So, <laughs> wow. so I went into advertising for the, you know, natural resource, uh, natural reason that it is, it is what our industry is mostly based on or was based on. So it was the opportunities that we have to earn a living doing this. Um, but I, and I, I feel very grateful of having uh, done the uh, commercials because as Marianne says, it gives you the, the tools and the learning experience with a lot of resources to start knowing how to manage a project, but if it was of my choosing, I would have never have stopped doing documentaries. Is what I love. I love doing that more than feature films. I really, um, it, it, it's very, 
eh, enriquecedor. I can't think of the word right now. Uh, to do something, yeah. to be able to do something and, and spend your days doing what you know how to do, being creative because the resources are less and you have to be more creative in, in, in the production side. You have to be more creative in terms of, you know, the budget and, and everything, but you're always learning and learning not only through the content, but learning how to do things differently and how and new ways of doing things. So that for me is very, it's great. Um, so, and then feature films, I love too, you know, so that was a, a normal, you know, I guess transition. transition. Yeah. Um, opportunities came and and obviously that's something I, I do like to but if if it was of my choosing I would do only documentaries wow and question for both of you um so now within within that experience how do you consider like budget wise uh and position wise what I know that it has been really hard for women content creators, and now the question of LGBTQ and BIPOC um, content creators to have a seat at the table. Have you seen a trend towards that? Have, how would you consider that within this particular project that you have done? Hmm. <laughs> no, um, it's hard to say because I think I had the opportunity to pitch for this documentary because I'm a woman and I'm a Latina. Mm. I don't know if I would have had the opportunity to pitch, to have the opportunity to pitch, not to even be able to do it, but just to pitch if I wasn't, if it was another story, if it was another subject. Um, so I do think, I do know that there's a big boss right now here in Hollywood about being Latina, being a woman, and 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 people trying to to find um, a place for the women and Latinas to 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 be able to direct or to be able to be leads in in leaders in the different departments, but I'm not sure if that's actually happening. happening. Right. Unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> like for yeah, example. You, how many people in key positions within your crew were either BIPOC, Latinos, uh, women? Uh -huh. Well, adding to Mariam, like real briefly, I, I totally agree. I, I want to be hopeful. And I think when projects come into our hands, um, we're given the opportunity as women. I think most of us take that like as a great gift in, to put into you know, giving opportunity to more, more women, but I think there's a long, you know, road to, <laughs> to travel yet, uh, still. Um, we, uh, Mariam and I talked from the beginning that we wanted to include as much, as many um, women as possible. We had like a list of priorities and we said, first, Puerto Rican women, then Latino women, then women of any race, and then Puerto Ricans, men, and then Latin, and then men. You know, that was wow. Our, and we we were committed to that in every we filmed in in more than five um, cities. And in and every time we went to a place, that would be our you know priority, which is not always easy to achieve because there's not many women that lead departments, you know, or that are available. But I was looking, you know, seeing your, your, your question, I went into the, into the project and I noticed we actually have like a ratio of eight women to six men in leading positions um, and very important positions, you know, like not speaking about director and producer, but also um, the, the composer is a woman, the music supervisor is a woman. We had woman, uh, women um, assistant camera, we had um, a, an associate producer who's a woman. Um, so yeah, so we were very conscious of, and those are in the leading roles, but we had, we hired PAs that were women, you know, our crew was 
whenever possible was mostly women. So yeah. And if not Latinos in general. Yes, yes. Wow, we wow. Had very wow. few white men in, in our yeah. in our crew. Mm -hmm. I mean our producer Brent Miller, he's a white man, but he's um LGBTQ. So um there you yeah. go. <laughs> no, wow, I'm really I, I really um thank you for doing that because I I I pose the question and sometimes it's really uncomfortable. Um because I'm usually interviewing women and, and then it's the moment where we realize that we have internalized our um, patriarchy at some, at some level that we're unconscious about it. And I, I put the questions and it's always this part of the interview where it's kind of uncomfortable because we have to look at the numbers and realize that we haven't done it in the back end, you know, in the, in the behind the scenes, like literally rethink our position as 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 opening the door to other minorities not only women but you know latinos right. or lgbt crew like you know it's it's really it's it's really touchy and it's a conversation that we either have now before we actually start shooting because it will change the content it will change the way that is shot the way that it's money is allocated and and used um, and then I go to my next topic, um, funding. Um, the reason why I ask about funding, it might sound technical, but there are many filmmakers out there that are really interested in, in voicing this new way of thinking, either by documentary or either by fiction um, filmmaking, but they don't know where to start and they don't know what their allies are. You know, like who is, is willing to give money to these projects? Yours is very specific because it's Rita Moreno and, and Rita is a trailblazer, but, but many other projects will find themselves not knowing where to knock. So what was your funding like? How did it work? Um, and you know, what are your suggestions for these young or, or new voices within filmmaking? Well, our project had the privilege of having, you know, being, um, this project was pitched by our, I pitched to Rita first and then to PBS by our um, producer, Brent Miller, who is the president of production at uh, Act 3, the Normal Leaders production company. Can you repeat um, that? Normal Leaders? Norman Lear. Norman, Norman Lear. Lear. Norman Lear. Okay, okay. So, um, so he pitched the idea to, he had done a documentary on Norman and um, he pitched the idea once Rita agreed, he pitched the idea to PBS, to American Masters, and they agreed right away. So most of the funding came from them. Mm -hmm. um, um, but then um, there was some um, gap at the end and, um, and Brent went and got it from private investors. Um, I say that um, I think, you know, we are privileged, Maria and I, to have <laughs> done this project with these conditions but our reality is that when we do our independent films it's hard but maybe because sometimes you don't think that they're allies like Michael Cantor who's the executive producer for American Masters which now by knowing him I know that maybe you go with a good idea that that fits the um, framework franchise, the franchise yeah. of American Master and he would back you up or or Brent who develops films. So most people don't get that opportunity. I say that in a very humble way and, and very grateful way because you know we're independent filmmakers and we know how we struggle. But in yeah, this yeah. case, we were very, very fortunate to, to have that opportunity. Did you use any tax incentives within any of the countries that you shall know? Okay. No, I don't know. So you really didn't have to deal with that big mammoth of paperwork. Right. Okay, okay, <laughs> good. Um, question within that framework of budget, do you have a general feel of, well, I don't know if this is the appropriate question, but how is their distribution in terms of women within that PBS American master? How many women are there? How many? BIPOC or LGBTQ? 
I I don't know. We don't know because um, we, although we worked with them through emails and stuff, we we haven't met them in person actually. <laughs> And it's kind of an awkward question, like, hi, are you, <laughs> like, how but do you I can, I can say that the Norman Lear uh, documentary was directed by two women, Heidi and Rachel. Um, and, um, and also that recently I've seen uh, many documentaries about women. You know, they did the Toni Morrison, they produced the Toni Morrison documentary. They recently write, actually right now, and it's gonna be on Tribeca too, the Amy Tan documentary. So, so yeah, like Marianne says, um, we don't have that, that of a close relationship into the franchise, but for what I've seen, I, I've, seen I, I've seen that they're conscious of it, you know, okay. I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, then, what would you guys consider the biggest hurdle in your production? Um, first of all, what was your final budget for this film? It was um, 1.6 something. 1.6. What was the biggest part of that budget allocated to? Uh, it was actually post-production, including archival. So it's two separate um, segments of the budget, um, but our, you know, this is a documentary full of incredible archival footage yeah. and photos and music and um, Mariem, um, you know, the music in the documentary is amazing and the selection of archival music, it's, you know, entirely a decision of Mariem and, and she, you know, she was great at it and, but it was, you know, Nina Simone and and uh, Fania, it was it was Frank Sinatra. It was like you know, like uh, music. Yeah, yeah. So and 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 so with the, and the same with the with the archival footage. You know, we have um, we have uh, footage from all the Sesame Street. You know, like I love all of I the love. studios, most of the shows, many interviews, like Jimmy Kimmel, or you know. So yeah, so archival was a big part of it and post-production in whole. And I have so, to say that I'm so lucky that I was able to, to have all that resources there, especially dreaming with the music that I wanted to have in the documentary and having it in my editing just for inspiration and then hoping that I could have La Lupe in the documentary and Nina Simone and, and, and being able to have them, that was a gift. Um, and also all the archival footage, it's very expensive and, and even allocating it, even finding it, um, it's very expensive. So I found some. <laughs> I remember that. Um, yes. Yeah, for all that you don't know, I, I worked behind the scenes as well in this production. Um, <laughs> But a little bit. Um, on archival. Very huh? on archival, actually. Yeah, I really, I was really honored. Um, so I guess, I guess that that being said, what what um, we have a couple more minutes. But what would you be? What would you consider um, the biggest hurdle, pet peeve of a production? And I will give you like a sort of brief. Um, I've asked around, and someone said, "Oh, it's." You know, I hate um, the waste that is created in filmmaking. I wish we would do like donating um, clothing or donating wardrobe or, or sets to poor people. Um, another one said babysitting department. What do you think would help, um, would bring about creating safe environments or, or better conversations regarding new voices? You know, either women, either black, either BIPOC or LGTB crew, um, you know, what would be the biggest hurdles creating filmmaking within these safe spaces? Well, I would I would say I would consider saying because it's something that it's been in my mind late, lately and that I would hope to have it in my next project in and maybe it's something very personal and spiritual, but I think the importance of um, not thinking that because you're doing a project, you, you're working 24 hours, um, respecting that space to, 
to, you know, <laughs> to live, to have your weekends, to have your nights, to sleep, to rest. Um, we usually work 12 hours minimum to, I don't know how long, it's never 10 hours, it's never eight hours, it's always the minimum 12 hour hours. And I honestly think that we all have to do our part in respecting the time the, the, that people have families and have the needs of resting and, and eating and sleeping and being with um, themselves too. And, and it's something that it has nothing to do with how to do it, but it has to do with having that, con that conscience and respecting that. And also um, the food that you eat. I think it's important to, to be more aware of um, not because you're quick, you need to eat um, fast food or, or, or junk food, I think. Um, and not because um, it's a food that is more nutrition needs to be more expensive. I think we should be more aware of that because if we want to continue making films and, and having a good environment, and, and, and I'm not talking about me as a director, but the, the whole crew, the, the people that go, uh, the, I don't know, the, the ones that are there first and leave last, they have families, they have kids, and, and, and it's important for them to, to eat well, <laughs> to continue their lives. To, yeah. So that's, that's my thoughts. I can, I wish, I, I, yeah, I need that too. And Ilya, what would you consider would be something that could be brought to filmmaking? new idea of filmmaking? Hmm. I, 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 I don't know if it would apply, but in a, and, and maybe going back to the same thing, in an, in an ideal world of filmmaking, it should be more equal towards, you know, like men and women. We shouldn't have this um, difference, you know, so, broad you know because for on one side I tell you that we made the effort and we were able to achieve and in most times but that doesn't translate to the reality of sets you know you see sets all the time where you know it's a proportion of one to ten or one to twenty you know so I I have made the like a promise to myself that I'm going to try to have that as a motto of mine to try to fill sets with women and try to train more women if they're not um, uh, trained and, and give more opportunities to women. Because I think um, I think if we don't do it, no one's gonna do it. You know, it's like, it's, it, it hasn't been done and it's not going to be done unless we do it. So, um, so in terms of a, an ideal uh, scenario of filmmaking, I would say that. Uh, uh, a scenario where we're at least equal, you know, half and half. It's only fair. I have I have posed this same uh, conundrum to like other filmmakers, men, and their response has been very varied. Like, oh, but now we're gonna give away um, a project to a woman just because she's a woman, not because she's the most talented. And it always goes back to like, yeah, but you know, if we never give opportunities to women and or train, as you say, or women or just minority content creators, um, there will never be a place on the table for either. Um, so I do well, agree. It's not, true. it's not true that, that yeah. you know, it's like saying only men are capable of doing, you know, because right now it's, it's not proportionate. And then it's not. what are you saying in a, in a world that it's mostly populated by women, uh, you're gonna say that there's not enough women that can do these kind of jobs. So it's not true yeah. and that's part of the problem. The problem yeah. is that men think like that, men are not gonna do the effort. So it's our duty, it's our responsibility to be conscious of that, to not turn the, the, the head away and not the look away and not, see it as our responsibility. In everything that we do, we need to be more inclusive of minorities and women and yeah, because and it's, not, it's not fair. Yeah, and to add to that, um, 
if the women don't have that resume that the men have is mm -hmm. because they haven't give, they didn't have the opportunity the men that are there and have that resume is because someone gave them the opportunity so it's up to us to give them the opportunity and i mean i know <laughs> So much <laughs> without it having the the experience that it doesn't it's right. not something that worries me at all <laughs> yeah i'm not worried at all i definitely am interested in voicing um and giving the opportunity that's the reason why we have these behind love scenes specially geared to producers and content creators rather than actors i'm an actor myself and I have chosen not to do so um, because I believe that it is very important for the people who are creating these spaces to have more visibility. Um, so I thank you again for your time. I'm very honored um, to have been able to spend a little bit of a time with you guys, uh, ideas and back and forth. Um, the film is wonderful. I cried. <laughs> I cry about everything, but I cried specifically because it was very, um, very much what I'm interested in is seeing women who have been consistent about voicing their needs in a very visible way. And she has done that more and beyond possible. She's definitely someone to follow. Um, as you guys, I'm very honored that, that you're my friends, but beyond that, I'm very good um, creators within your worlds and I want people to know more of you guys so I love you I will finish the interview thank you guys for this behind the scenes with Marian Perez, Marian Perez and Ilia Vélez for Rita Moreno's documentary thank you so much and see you again thank you, thank you.